Boy, have I been waiting to do this one. Bosses have got to be one of my favorite countdown topics. They're some of the most important parts of the game because they put your skills and knowledge to the test or end up being really exciting moments in general. But those aren't the ones we're talking about today. Praising fun bosses is cool and all, but complaining is arguably even more fun. So let's do that instead. I have talked about bosses numerous times in various videos, so a few ended up getting scrapped from the list so I didn't run the risk of being repetitive. With one little bit of exception. Also, unlike a future favorite bosses list, I'm actually going to be including final bosses here. I thought it'd be entertaining to throw a few of those into the mix. And with all that out of the way, it's time to see if I can extract any sort of enjoyment from these bosses at all. Probably not. You know, now that I think about it, a lot of the bosses in the Bravely Default series were handled pretty well. The games have a job system that lead to a lot of creative strategies that you can use on these bosses. Also, you get these jobs from the bosses whenever you beat them, so their fights mostly revolve around their abilities. As for what they do for jobs that revolve around support abilities, they usually pair that boss with another one. They do this because how do you make a boss fight around a class that involves buffs and debuffs? I'll tell you one thing, Angelo is a textbook example of how not to do this. He wields the Patissier Asterisk, a job that uses debuff abilities for the most part. But before we even get into the fight, there's something I have to bring up that happens beforehand. You first encounter him in Yunohana, where one of your party members is tricked into eating one of his treats. Whichever party member you choose to eat it, freaking turns into a ghost. While they're in this ghost form, they can only use magic abilities, so if you used it on your physical attacker, then you're kind of just screwed. And while the ghost can't be targeted, if your other three party members die, then it's a game over. And alongside that handicap, you have to deal with Angelo's reinforcements. The medic supplies the other two with more BP so that they can take multiple actions in a single turn. Then, there's the one with the katana, easily the most annoying part about the fight. She's the main source of offense on the team, and has an attack that instantly kills you if you're under a certain threshold of health. Angelo himself doesn't actually contribute a whole lot to the fight. Occasionally he'll lower your defense with one of his attacks, and if he has some extra BP from the medic, he might chip in with a regular attack. So essentially, the character that this fight is based around doesn't actually add much to it. I don't know what he could do because Cake has never been threatening before. Which one's more threatening? The Katana? or the virgin with the cake cutter. You know what? She might as well be the boss. It's a pretty boring fight because all you're doing is just trying to keep your party healthy so that you're safe from the instant kill attack. The fight was made this way because Angelo wasn't paired up with anyone else. Nikolai is a bishop who mainly heals and he got paired up with Jan. Later on in the game, he's paired up with Amy and they actually have really good chemistry. Yeah, this boss fight was about as well planned out as bringing a cake to a sword fight. He's at the bottom because it's mostly just dull, it's definitely more annoying than fun, but compared to the rest of the list, this spot is pretty interchangeable. Psychonauts has one of the most mediocre boss lineups I've ever seen. The game has very fun levels, but most of these bosses feel like they were made out of obligation. They definitely weren't all bad, but a lot of them were pretty underwhelming. And then there's the one that had plenty of potential, but just ended up being a boring slog. <laughs> The Longfish has so little to offer in terms of entertainment. The fight goes a little something like this. It'll follow you throughout some platforming segments, and you'll eventually stop to actually fight it. All it does is spit crap at you, and you break the box of nails when it's sucking water back in. I had a bowl of nails for breakfast! Do this a couple times, and eventually you'll reach... Weech. Do this a few times, and you'll eventually reach your last stop. You have to bait the lungfish into swinging its headlamp and getting it stuck in between these clams, leaving it vulnerable. You know, it's actually a pretty decent part of the fight, not gonna lie. But the big issue with the fight though? The auto-scrolling segments. There's a lot of platforming in these, and it seems like a fun addition until you play it yourself. I usually enjoy stuff like this because it makes for an energetic chase. Problem here though, is that it's not so much a chase, and more of a do some platforming for a bit and wait for the fish to catch up. Need up. Slow down. I need a second. C 
Come on, please be patient. Ah! Yep, you can only move in the area that's currently inside the bubble, so most of the time is just spent waiting for it to catch up to you. I mean, I guess I'd rather be in here than have those scary hands grab me. Maybe. This just ruins what little there was and makes for an extremely dull fight. I mean, are you not completely enthralled? Is this not the most exciting thing you've seen all day long? I could go to sleep, wake up the next morning, and we'd still be having a party in the exact same spot. I don't get why they didn't rework these sections or at least make them shorter, but it's so mind-numbingly boring because of how long it takes to get from point A to point B. This had the potential to be a really unique and fun boss fight, but unfortunately it ended up more boring than the others. Even though it only has 6 bosses, it seems like I'll be bringing up ukulele a lot in these types of countdowns. It's a pretty mixed bag, and everyone seems to have a different favorite and least favorite boss. Now I've heard some people voice their complaints with my boy capital B, but after enough attempts I know that fight like the back of my hand. Also, don't even think about trying to trash talk him. I've got ways to make you regret that. <laughs> Inept is my least favorite. It really sucks that I don't like this boss considering that Capital Cashino was my favorite level in the game. This fight takes place at the end of the Kortos mission of this level, so we're already off to a bad start. These were some of the low points of the game to me because Kortos felt really difficult to control. Now let's throw that into a boss fight. The first phase is the worst. He'll lay these spike balls on the track and you have to avoid them. After you avoid his onslaught, he'll charge at you and you have to shoot him. My issue here is that sometimes the pattern of the balls feels unavoidable. You can use Kortos to destroy a few of them, but they still end up being difficult to get past. So you better not suck and touch the balls. That came out incorrectly. What really gets under my skin is how sometimes if you get hit, he'll do this stupid little laugh like <laughs> I hit you, 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 you stop it! And then he'll lay out another set. The second phase isn't as bad, but it's like if the auto-scrolling segments in the lungfish fight were boring and annoying. He literally just goes back and forth and you have to hit him. It just goes on way longer than it should. In the final phase, he'll shoot out missiles that go along the track and you have to jump over them. I'm just glad that the fight got progressively less worse. Or we move on, I've heard people say that Inept is a parody of the Kinect since these are ex Rare developers we're talking about. If they wanted to parody that peripheral then they did a good job, it was executed as poorly, and it's annoying to interact with, so they have something in common. There are a lot of Pokemon candidates for this list. But I feel like that there are some easy counters to Whitney, and as for Evis, I already talked about him last year. So, he has escaped the wrath of the log. Good work. But I still have some good material to work with thanks to Elisa. She serves as the electric type gym leader. Now she's lucky that there are some good electric types to work with in Unova, so what's her team comprised of? Two Emolga and a Zebstrika. Now normally, the problems would end here and we'd move on, however, there's one move that makes these Amolgas so annoying. Volt Switch. Now then, if you fought her yourself, you'd probably be surprised to find out that this isn't their only move. This would be shocking, but dang it. This is unexpected because this is the only move that they use 90% of the time. It does a decent amount of damage and allows her to switch out, so most of the fight is just her flip-flopping between her two Amolgas. Earlier, we were dealing with cakes being lobbed at us. Now how does it feel to have a squirrel launched at you every two seconds? It's not fun. The best thing you can do is send out a ground type that has a rock type move so that you can deal with the Amolgas easily. And even though that's their worst move taken care of, they still had the other options. That's why no matter which starter you pick, they probably aren't going to contribute a whole lot to the battle. Oh, and I forgot to mention, on top of all this, you still have to deal with the Zeb Strika. Just your typical gym leader's final strong Pokemon fair here. Except this time, you're gonna be whittled down by two stupid squirrels beforehand. I'll give Evers some credit, at least he had thought put behind his team. If I wanted to deal with someone spamming the same move over and over again, then I'd go play Smash Ultimate online.
I will never not look forward to final bosses. There's so much to be excited for. The design, the music, the boss fight itself. What I said about bosses in general at the beginning of the countdown, yeah, this is multiplied for final bosses. It's just a real shame that some games end up underperforming, like Citizens of Earth. I don't know why I was looking forward to the climax of this game, maybe because it had the chance to be something really unique and special, but no, this is like the most half-assed final boss I think I've seen in years. So you just saved the world from aliens and you think everything's going to be okay, but then all of a sudden your hometown is on fire and in chaos. Who could possibly be behind all this? Well, it's none other than your own secretary. He's been jealous of all of your power, and now he's going to take it right from you. Time to battle Leonard from the Big Bang Theory, and this fight is pretty lame. Having the twist with this secretary being behind everything is so cool, but this fight didn't deliver anything. None of his attacks have any complexity to them at all. They're really nothing of note. I mean, he's pretty strong, and he's got a cool robot, I'm not really sure what else I can say. On my first playthrough, I spent like half an hour retrying this fight, and then on my second playthrough, I literally beat him in two turns. Is he too hard? Is he too easy? I honestly have no clue. I do know something though, this is the most anticlimactic final boss I've ever fought. The only checkmark this gets is the design itself is pretty cool looking, but he's not very fun, and I'm dead serious, he doesn't even get his own unique song. The song they chose here is probably the worst one they could have used, and it just adds to the mediocrity. I'm not even gonna bother talking about the misery machine, I mean it's cool that the VP himself actually fights, but other than that, it's the most standard thing you could ever see from an RPG final boss fight. But here's the funniest thing, it set my expectations so low for the finale of the sequel, but even with how low the bar was, it still managed to be worse than this. But thankfully, it had one major positive trait, the final boss of Citizens of Space blew my expectations out of the water, by simply having its own song. LBX was probably the last game I played that had significant difficulty spikes. The types of ones where you're stuck on a boss or level for literal days or even weeks. And as many good things as there are in this game, there's some horrible design choices that make these even worse. During one scenario of the game, you're taking part in a tournament and you're up against a person named Daxindo. He's been built up to have a lot of skill and be a huge threat, so the boss fight against him must be super exciting, right? It seems that way at first, you're just trading blows with his LBX, Harlequin. But once you get it down to half health, things take a huge turn for the worse. On one hand, Harlequin creates two clones of itself, but on the other hand, your LBX gets a hold of the new V-Mode ability. My guess is that the developers intended for V-Mode to make you strong enough so that you could take on three at once. That didn't work. Instead, you're going to spend the whole fight getting gang raped by a bunch of scary robots with hooks. That sounds horrific, I know, but it's not nearly as terrifying as what happens if you lose the fight. You see, this game likes to implement a lot of cutscenes in the middle of fights, and the cutscenes are pretty long. Sounds like they could add a lot to the fights, right? No, instead they end up being the worst part about them. This game has an awful cliche that used to plague a lot of games. They've since been replaced by timers that don't stop in the middle of cutscenes. Say it with me now, unskippable cutscenes. Yep, if you lose the fight, which I'm pretty certain that you will because of how difficult it is, you have to watch all the cutscenes that took place in the middle of it all over again. Something I find baffling is that some of the cutscenes are skippable in this game, but a good chunk of them aren't. Now imagine losing this hard as balls boss fight two or three times. I think the ones here go on from three to seven minutes. Okay, how about we take a second to check. Why is this taking so long? It's infuriating because you feel like you can't do anything against all of these Harlequins everywhere. There's too much to deal with. This isn't challenging. It's unfair. And like I said, V-Mode doesn't compensate for this. It's a horribly difficult, poorly designed boss that's riddled with unskippable cutscenes. 
I don't get how they thought that this was passable. Well, this pick might be a bit controversial. Okay, so Luigi's Mansion bosses, they're typically just decent. Like, yeah, you do have to deal with ones like Bulosis, or whatever Dark Moon's lineup was supposed to be. But at least Luigi's Mansion 3 had more good than bad. Focusing the boss fights around puzzles actually served them pretty well. They're really satisfying to solve, and the game had good puzzles already. They had a pretty good formula with the bosses in this game. Too bad they threw it all away with King Boo. I did not expect this to suck so badly. It had such good buildup, but it was all wasted on quite possibly one of the most tedious bosses I've ever fought. You probably have no idea where I'm coming from. From your eyes, it just looks like a regular King Boo boss fight. But it's actually worse. He'll start off with some easily avoidable attacks, such as dodging these fireballs or jumping over his tongue. Seems a little too simple, but I guess they just want an easy win. Eventually, he'll throw some bombs at you that you have to shoot back at him while he's looking very disgruntled. Slam him into the ground afterwards and he'll duplicate himself, multiplying the attacks. Maybe the fight will become a little more challenging now? Okay, I guess not. Yeah, aside from introducing a new attack, that's all that they change in this phase. The only difference aside from that is that one of them is a fake and you have to determine which one is the real one before you shoot the bomb. After this, King Boo enlarges the painting he's trying to trap you inside to the point where it rips the hotel out of the ground. Sounds like a fun way to close off the final boss. Oh no. Now we have three King Boos to deal with, which actually make the attacks somewhat challenging to avoid, and a time limit. And this is what I hate so much about the fight. The time limit is artificial difficulty. He goes through his attack cycle for so long that you'll probably only get like three chances to shoot bombs at him. And there are so many factors going against you. You have to pick up a bomb, determine which King Boo is the real one, avoid their attacks, get in a good aim, and hope that the bomb actually shoots properly. And I'd be more on board with all of that if you didn't have to work under the pressure of a time limit. If you lose, then you have to replay the first two phases again. But those are so boring to go through. He isn't legitimately challenging. Like, yeah, I hate to say it, the tongue attack can be a little bit hard to avoid every now and then. And there is the variation of the bomb attack in the final phase, which is something along the lines of... <laughs> but apart from those two attacks, nothing else in the fight is really hard. If it wasn't for the time limit, I wouldn't have lost on this fight a single time. If they wanted to make a good boss, then they should have done one of two things. Either make the boss more fun so I didn't mind losing, or don't add in an unnecessary time limit. So yeah, this fight only appeals to two kinds of people. People with wrong opinions, and people with weird fetishes. I am running out of ways to open up Cuphead segments. I guess it comes with the territory. If the game's going to focus around bosses, then it's probably going to have a place on a lot of boss countdowns, including this one. And I have to say something first. Fonzo, this is for you. That's right, the long-awaited Lago Rants About Calo Maria moment is finally here. I even brought a little something special for the occasion. Even though there are still two more entries that I dislike more, this one's probably caused me the most misery. The first phase has a surprising variety of attacks, shooting projectiles at you, rising pufferfish, a, a seahorse. But what's really interesting is how she uses two at once, effectively combining the strength of both of them. The problem is that you usually end up getting stuck with a hellish combination. Good luck avoiding the pufferfish and the ghost at the same time. Or what about the seahorse keeping you at the top of the screen while you have to avoid the boomerang fish? This combo thing seems like a much better idea for literally any other type of game, but with Cuphead, there's just too much going on already. Moving on to phase two, things go from stupidly hard to just plain stupid. She turns into freaking Medusa and can turn you into stone. It sure is fun not being able to move while I have to avoid projectiles from these eels. The most effective method of escaping this form is having a seizure on your keyboard. Even then, you still have to deal with a ton of the eels. What I personally recommend is using your special to blow them all up. 
You see, during this phase, Calamaria doesn't actually use any attacks, she relies on the eels. And for the final phase, you chase her head throughout these narrow caverns. Now while the amount of projectiles has significantly reduced, the annoyance of turning to stone has only been tripled. One of two things will happen, either you're stuck long enough that you hit the wall, or you mash too hard and you end up bumping yourself into the wall. I can understand someone liking the first phase, but the other two are purely rage inducing. I don't find this boss nearly as difficult nowadays, but whenever I first played the game, it was pure suffering. Just thinking about it hurts my head. So, uh, about that one exception I made. I bet the previous viewers of my channel thought I'd be reusing a boss from top 10 difficult bosses. But nope, that's good old logo for ya. I like to surprise my audience. So I've decided to talk about Dark Crafter again since I feel like it's been long enough that it's warranted. And also for another reason I'll get into later. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse had some decent ideas for bosses. Yeah, none of them were really great, but they were still pretty fun. But how did they screw up this final boss so badly? The boss fight with Clacia beforehand was surprisingly good, so why didn't they just expand on that instead? I guess they really wanted to incorporate an alternate gameplay segment into the final boss fight, because that always turns out well. It was such a terrible idea to use the rocket transformation here. Normally, you draw lines for Kirby to roll around on, but while in the rocket transformation, he constantly goes forward. So in order to move him, you have to awkwardly deflect him with the line. And trust me, that's the opposite of epic whenever you have all these spike balls to avoid. Oh, and while I'm at it, I guess I should mention something kind of minor. That's his only attack! This evil pile of rainbow doo-doo wants to do something... What was your plan again? But his only way of hurting you is by throwing spikes? <laughs> And if you want to deal damage to him, you have to gather up a hundred stars and then aim properly at him. Do that a few times and you win. That's seriously it. What the crap kind of final boss is this? Even if it was this pathetic, if it was at least a little bit fun, I'd be more like, Oh, it's already over. I mean, I, I guess it was okay. But no, what little depth the fight had wasn't fun at all. A Dark Crafter is an absolute embarrassment. The only positive trait that he has besides the music is that he used to be my least favorite boss. That's also the second reason why I'm talking about him again. But unlike number one, I see that the developers were trying to make a fun boss here. It's just whatever they did try didn't turn out properly. You're probably getting sick of me talking about how much I love final bosses and stuff. I think you get the idea by now. My favorite final bosses have great designs, fun gameplay, incredible music, and satisfying scenarios to end the game off with. But does epic music even matter if the scenario is underwhelming? And how much can you get out of the design in the middle of the battle with a really bad song playing? The point I'm trying to make here is that all of these aspects should work together and not have one lag behind. Especially whenever the aspect that matters the most, the gameplay, ends up being the worst part of the fight. This fight had those other three aspects going for it, but as for the gameplay, they tried to do something different. And it went so horribly wrong. I haven't seen a boss fight with so many astronomical frickups in my entire life. You made the unepicness detector explode! What kind of monster are you? I bet you're very curious to hear about the design flaws with Dame Demona from Yokai Watch 2. Instead of questioning whether or not the level stealing gimmick from the first fight was any good, they just went ahead and stepped hard on the gas pedal and threw in so many more gimmicks like this. And if you're a first time player, then you might find out about one of the new gimmicks 5 seconds in. Most of the bosses in this series have multiple parts of their body that you can target, so out of sheer instinct, you might have one of your 
Yokai charge up his ultimate move, because these moves usually hit all targets. But in this fight, you're severely punished for doing that. Whenever you're charging up a ultimate, Dame Nimona will steal it from you and then use her own. Sometimes she doesn't, sometimes she does. Some sources say that you have to knock out these dragons to prevent her from doing this, but I swear I've done that before and she still does it anyway. The behavior of this skill is so unpredictable so it's best not to tempt it. Have fun not using Sultimans the whole battle. But would you believe me if I said it actually gets worse? Let's see, regular attack, normal debuff move. Oh, stealing my yokai's turns, how fun. That's correct, these dragons will take a turn from your yokai and use the move that they were going to use on them. This includes healing moves that can be a deciding factor of whether or not you win the fight. But Lug, can't you just use your own healing items instead? Well, I would do that, but she has an attack for that as well. My yokai sure could use some healing. I do have a soulman that heals, but I might get immediately wiped out if she decides to steal it. Oh well, at least somebody's getting use out of my soul points. At least fly away soul gives us some room to breathe. These little spirits will fly around and you have to shoot them with your pen. If you take too long, then they'll do huge damage to your yokai. But that's pretty easy to prevent and there's no strings attached, right? Know something really epic? If she outspeeds you, then she'll send them flying at you immediately giving you no time to prevent the attack. They tried so many things to make this fight creative, but it just ended up as a huge mess. The difficulty of this fight is about as comparable as McCracken from the first game, if not a little bit harder. But there is one major distinction that makes McCracken not horrible. He's difficult because he has strong inspiritments with a variety of hard-hitting attacks. Dame Demona, on the other hand, is difficult because her moveset is comprised of a bunch of unfair abilities. She'll shut down important options, take turns from you, and make your soul a 50-50 coin toss that can backfire. This isn't enjoyable. It just makes me question if the developers were trying to make this fun at all. I'm Logo the Logician, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Dame Dead Time is evil because she had everything taken away from her for a crime she didn't commit. As revenge, she wants to take happiness away from other people. That's cool and all, but you don't have to have that same effect on the player.